But I want to share with you a little message that,、uh, that kind of relates to our mission trip to Osaka, Japan. If you could open your Bible to Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 40. Matthew 25, verse 31 to 40. This is a passage or chapter that I read. Every time I read, read this passage, it really, really blesses me and it challenges me. Matthew chapter 25, verse 31 to 40. Let's all read it together. It's a little bit long, but let's read it slowly and let's read it together. Ready? Begin. But when the Son of Man comes in his glory and all the angels with him, Then he will sit upon his glorious throne. All the nations will be gathered in his presence, and he will separate the people as a shepherd separates the sheep from the goats. He will place the sheep at his right hand and the goats at his left. Then the king will say to those on his right, Come, you who are blessed by my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the creation of the world. For I was hungry, and you fed me. I was thirsty, and you gave me a drink. I was a stranger, and you invited me into your home. I was naked, and you gave me clothing. I was sick, and you cared for me. I was in prison, and you visited me. Then these righteous ones will reply, Lord, when did we ever see you hungry and feed you, or thirsty and give you something to drink, or a stranger and show you hospitality, or naked and gave you, give you clothing? When do we ever see you sick or in prison and visit you? And the king will say, I tell you the truth. When you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, you are doing it to me. You're doing it to me. You know, I've mentioned this during the Christmas season, but, you know, it's strange that why is that during Christmas season that we exchange gifts to one another? Because Christmas, we're celebrating whose birthday? It's Jesus' birthday. And I've said this to my children on a few occasions that, hey, why is it that you're getting a present on Jesus' birthday? And I mentioned this also in the past in America. And when I tell this to church members, you know, they're like, yeah, that's true, that's true. But the next obvious question is then what do we get for Jesus? We're celebrating Jesus' birthday, then we are to get Jesus' presents. But really, what do you give to a God? I mean, think about it. Can you give him a bicycle? <laughs> you know? I mean, he created the universe with a simple word. You know? He can move a mountain probably with the blink of an eye. What do you give to a, an almighty God, a creator, the maker of everything? Well, the passage that we read gives us the answer to that question. How do we give to God? The Bible makes it very clear. When we give, when we serve, When we help the least, God says, then you are, it is just as the same as doing it unto me. When we help the poor, when we give to the needy, when we serve the, the rejected, God says, that's just like doing it unto me. But the first thing as Christians we need to understand and we need to identify is really, what are the least? Who are the least that God is talking about in this passage? One, one of those are literally are those who have the least, such as the poor and the homeless. God is telling us that when we give to the poor, when we help the needy, when we serve the homeless, God is saying that it is just like doing it unto me. The second thing that we can get from this, second thing is who are the least? is It is those who are ignored and overlooked. The Bible says that when we help and give and sacrifice to those who are ignored and overlooked, it is just, as, it's just like doing it unto Him. But who are the overlooked? Who are the ignored? Those are the people, such people as maybe mentally disabled people, maybe people in prison, or perhaps people with. AIDS or HIV. Those people that the society tends to reject. The type of people that society doesn't want to be around. And God says that when we help these people, it is just like 
serving him. So who are the least? The third one is, least is those people who do not yet know God. And that's because there's nothing worse than to live and die not having known the loving relationship of our Lord Jesus Christ. There's nothing that is more least than not knowing and not having relationship with God. So as Christians, when we help these people, when we help the people that do not know God, get to know God, introduce them to God, the Bible says that it's just like doing it unto me. And I want to share, now, it's an old, old story. It's a little bit long, but bear with me. Once upon a time, there was a man named Conrad who had a shoe shop in a tiny village in Europe. One day, he had a dream that Jesus would visit him at his little shoe shop. And in his dream, he got up early in the morning. He swept and he dusted and got his little shop ready for the visit. He baked some bread and cakes and he waited with great anticipation for Jesus is about to come. And as the day went, went by, Conrad saw an old man outside his shop window that had no shoes on his feet. And this was, it was a very cold day. Moved with compassion, he brought the elderly man inside to warm, to warm up and gave him shoes for his feet. As Conrad continued to wait for Jesus to come, he heard a knock at the door. And with great excitement, he ran to the door only to see a little old lady. She had a bundle of sticks and had not eaten in some time. At first, Conrad was mad and disappointed because it was not Jesus. But then he was moved with with compassion to bring her into the little shop and gave her something to eat, including the cake and bread he had made for Jesus. After she had finished eating, He carried her sticks for her to the edge of the village and hurried back in fear that he would miss Jesus. But as he returned, Jesus still was not there. As the afternoon passed, Conrad waited, still no Jesus. And then there was another soft rap at the door. He thought, surely this must be Jesus. It was a little boy. He asked Conrad to help him find his way home. Conrad didn't want to leave, but his compassion led him to help the little boy find his way home. As fast as he could, he rushed back to the shop only to find it undisturbed. Jesus still not to be found. Conrad cried in his heart, Why is it, Lord? Did you forget this was a day that you're supposed to visit? Then in the soft stillness of the little shop, Conrad heard a voice. Lift up your heart, for I have kept my word. Three times I came to your friendly door. Three times my shadow was on your floor. Jesus came as the old man with no shoes, hungry old lady, and the little lost boy. Jesus comes to us in those who do need help, are hurting, hungry, thirsty, lost, sick, or even locked up in prison. The Bible tells us that as believers, that we are to reach out and help these people. As Christians, this is a truth. This truth is something that we all need to keep in our hearts as we live our lives. Because every day of our lives, we walk by people in need. Almost every day of our lives, we walk by and, peop- and see people who are hungry, who are cold, who are needy, who do not know God. But if we truly believe that by helping these people, we are helping Jesus, I think our attitude in our lives and our actions would be different. If we truly believe that behind every one of those faces was Jesus, I think definitely our attitude towards them would be different. But why is it? Why is it that this makes sense? Why is it that helping the poor, helping the needy, is just like helping 
Jesus. I mean, again, this is to me is a common sense. It's very plain and it's very simple. You know, being a pastor is difficult, but I'll tell you this. Being a pastor's wife is even more difficult. And one of the reasons is, is precisely, you know, where I just came from. I spent a week in Japan, and this time actually it was very, very short. You know, my faith is uh, six years old, and for the first four years of her life, I missed her birthday because I was away on a mission trip. And, uh, you know, this was one week, but in the past, I used to go on mission trips for two months at a time. And the, the hardest thing, actually, for me, is not the fact that I'm going to faraway places like maybe Afghanistan or Vladivostok, or, you know, exotic places like that. But the hardest part was leaving behind my wife and long, you know, young children. Because what if something happens? You know, your, your mind goes through all these things. You know, what if somebody breaks into our home? You know, what if she gets into an accident? What if our son and daughter gets really sick? And you know, it's going to be hard for my wife to take care of this all by herself. Well, one time when I was away on a mission trip, well, something did happen. It was on a rainy day, and I think she was on her way to church. And uh, it was you know, raining cats and dogs. It was raining really, really hard. And I found this out later that the, the tire, got, uh, she got a flat tire in the middle of the road. And usually, you know, if I was there, you know, the first person she would call is me. But in this occasion, I was like half, you know, halfway around the world. And she couldn't get in contact with me. She tried to contact some, you know, some of uh, my relatives, but they didn't answer. It was during the church times that they were all in church. Their cell phones were off. Thankfully, she was able to get in contact with uh, one of the church members. His name was Yong. Yong Baek. And in the middle of the rain, and, and this is a great guy. He came. He just came and changed the tire in the middle of the rain. He you know, took out the spare tire, changed the tire, did everything. Took it to the shop and got the, you know, everything done. I mean, this is the type of guy he is. He did everything for her. And when I came back, when I heard what had happened, and first of all, I felt bad that my wife had to go through these things. But the second emotion that I experienced was this great sense of gratitude. And I went out and seeked out Yong, and I just thanked him profusely. I said, thank you, Yong, so much. Thank you for being there for my wife and children. And I did not say this to him, but in my heart, when he did this for my wife and children, really, it was just as, as if he was doing it for me. In fact, I was even more grateful. Because if, you know, if he were to do that to me, I am thankful. But he did it to someone that was maybe less capable or in, in greater need. Someone that I cared about dearly. And that made me feel even more appreciative of what he did. See, that's, why, that's, what, that's how God feels about us, those of us who are in need. See, God created all of us. In the beginning, God created. And he created us. He calls us His own. He calls us His creation. He calls us His children. And when His children are in need, when they're hungry, when they're sick, when they're hurting, and when they do not understand or realize the love of God, it hurts God. And when we as believers reach out to these very people that God cares about so very much, in God's eye, it's just as as if we're doing it unto Him. Doesn't it make total sense? You know, I took our kids to Japan uh, this week, and, and I'll be honest with you, I told, it, I told this to the students, that you know what, this was probably one of the least prepared mission trips that I've ever led, and I mean that. Uh, for those of you that do know me, and for those of you who've known me in the past, I'm very thorough, I, I hate being unprepared, and, um, but, you know, for many reasons, we just didn't have the time. They didn't have the time. I didn't have the time. So why go on this mission trip? The answer was simple. You know, really, just going to Japan for one week, we're not going to turn the country upside down. Unrealistically, that's not going to happen. Being in Japan for one week, realistically, we're not going to really change the dynamics of the church that we went to serve. So why do we go? And my purpose was, was plain and simple. And I went for them. I went for them. You know, even though it may be a short trip, I really wanted them to experience 
experience what it means to love and to give and to uh, sacrifice. And I wanted them to really experience and have the heart, you know, heart of God. And when we go on mission trips, I wanted them to know that when we help these people, it's just like as if we're helping God. And those are some of the things that I wanted our team to learn. Because unless we make time to do you know, these things, believe it or not, we won't do them. Because we're just so busy. Because we're so busy, caught up with the busyness of our own lives. And secondly, we don't do these things simply because we have lost a heart for God. A wise woman who was traveling in the mountains found, a, found gold in a stream. And she was thrilled and excited at the discovery. discovery. And the next day, she met another traveler who happened to be hungry. So the wise old woman, she opened her bag to share her food. When, the, when she opened her bag, the hungry traveler immediately saw this precious gold in her bag and asked the woman if she could give it to him. And she did, without hesitation. The traveler left. Rejoicing in his good fortune, he knew that the gold was enough to give him security for the rest of his life. But a few days later, he came back and returned the gold back to this wise old woman. And he gave this reason. He said, I've been thinking, he said. I know, I understand how valuable this gold is. But I give it back in the hope that you can give me something even more precious. Give me what you have within you that allowed you to so freely give it away. Such precious gold. Basically what the man wanted was the heart that this woman had, the ability that she had, the heart that she had to give away such precious things. That's the reason why we go on mission trips, at least short-term mission trips, so that we can discover this heart to give. Because as we give, and as we serve, and as we sacrifice, we get a glimpse of God's heart. We spend hundreds of dollars. We sacrifice you know, hours and hours why? The answer is simple. Because we want something that's more precious than gold or silver. We want the heart that enables us to give. And that's why we went to this uh, trip to Japan. While we're in Japan, Hannah mentioned that you know, we did homeless ministry. I mean, we were so thankful for the opportunity to serve. But one of the things that really broke our hearts was that these men, they were not uneducated, they were not disabled, but they were still relatively young. There were some in their 30s, most of them were in their 40s, and then some in 50s and 60s. And I was told that some of these men were actually highly educated, some were doctors, some were engineers, and because of circumstances beyond their control, they became homeless. And when we were ministering to these people, it really stuck, you know, uh, struck our hearts. Every day, they average maybe eating one meal a day. And they sleep, you know, you know, makeshift shacks and tents. And that night was such a blessed night. Not because we shared, you know, we did a performance, but because we were able to share with them something that was very precious. One, we share with them food. And second, we share with them the knowledge and the love of Jesus Christ. And I tell you this, after that evening, people that were the happiest were not the people that were fed, not the people that sat and watched us, but the happiest group of people were us. Because we, at that moment, we discovered this joy. We discovered that there's something more precious than gold and silver. And that is the heart and the love that enables us to give 
freely. And that's why we went to Japan. And that's why we went to serve. We want the heart of God. Matthew 25 says, When you did it to one of the least of these my brothers and sisters, you were doing it unto me. And that is the truth that I wanted our team to discover during this mission trip. And I'm just so thankful. I am so thankful that again, God was so faithful to bless us throughout this trip.